Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. On December 12, 1928, two murders were committed in a historic home in Carbondale, Illinois, and those who have lived and worked in the place since that time have come to believe that the spirits of the dead still linger within its walls. The legend of the house claims that you can bury the bodies in Oakland Cemetery, but you can't make them rest there. Such stories are spread about a myriad of alleged haunted houses in the state of Illinois, but few of them have seen the kind of carnage and violence that occurred in the Huntley House in 1928. John Charles Huntley was a prominent wealthy citizen of Carbondale at the time of his death. He had been the mayor of the city in 1907 and 1908 and enjoyed many friendships and business acquaintances throughout the area. But Hunley's life had not always been perfect. In fact, in 1893, he had committed murder. At that time, Hunley had killed a music teacher in town but was acquitted by a jury after pleading the unwritten law, meaning that he had murdered the man who had been sleeping with his wife. The incident led to him divorcing his wife which caused bitter feelings between him and his son Victor. Although the problems between them had been supposedly settled years before the elder Hundley's death, some witnesses would later claim that the quarrels continued. This led to Victor becoming the chief suspect in the murder of his father. Hundley remarried a few years later, and in 1915 he and his wife Luella purchased a lot at the corner of Maple and Main Streets and constructed what became their sprawling and luxurious home. Luella Huntley was the daughter of Ruffin Harrison, one of the founders of the city of Heron and the owner of numerous coal mines in the region. She was the sister of George Harrison, president of Heron's First National Bank. She was said to have been an accomplished musician and very involved in local charity work. Perhaps for these reasons she was regarded as having no enemies, which made her murder all the more puzzling. The lives of the Hunleys were destroyed just before midnight on Wednesday, December 12, 1928. Investigators believed that Mr. Hunley was murdered first. His body was found in an upstairs bedroom, dressed only in a nightshirt and socks. He had been shot six times from behind with a 45 caliber revolver. His face had been ripped apart as the bullets exited his head. Mrs. Hunley was killed downstairs. She had been shot twice in the back of the head and once in the heart. She had been shot in a rear stairway, up which she had apparently started to climb in order to aid her husband. Her body had rolled into the kitchen, and a pencil was resting next to her left hand. 
an unfinished letter on the table in an adjoining room was mute evidence of what she was doing when she was alarmed by the shots that killed her husband. According to newspaper reports, police officers called by neighbors across the street who heard the shots being fired arrived at the scene of the crime within minutes. Chief of Police Joe Montgomery told the press the following morning that robbery seemed to be the most likely motive for the murders, even though the house was not disturbed when officers arrived. The only evidence that pointed to a robbery of the house, which contained valuable artwork, expensive furnishings, and a large amount of cash, was the discovery of an empty pocketbook on the floor near Luella Hundley's body. Neighbors told police that they believed the purse was kept in a writing desk downstairs. For this reason, and others still to be discovered, the police soon began to believe that there were other, darker motives for the crime. On the morning of December 13, police investigators thoroughly searched the Hunley home. Tracking dogs were brought in and placed on the trail of the killers, and four times the dogs led their handlers straight to the home of John Charles Hunley's son, Victor, a prominent coal dealer in the city. Investigators believed that the killer might have been known to Mrs. Hunley because it appeared that she had opened the door and let him into the house, as she would have done, even at that late hour, for her stepson. Victor also seemed to have a motive for the murders. At an inquest that was held that afternoon, Job Goodall, a friend of the Hundleys and the last person to see them alive, testified that the elder Hundley had recently told him that he planned to make a new will and disinherit Victor because he was no good. A bitter feud had long existed between father and son, which allegedly patched up, it had possibly flared into existence again. If this was the case, then Victor Hundley stood to lose a great amount of money if his father changed his will. With an estate worth more than $350,000, Victor would be left with only his trust fund, which amounted to less than $15,000. Goodall also told the coroner's jury that the Hunleys had been in excellent spirits when he visited with them on the night of their murders. They were planning a motor trip to their winter home in Florida, and they planned to leave on Sunday. Goodall left the Hundley home around 8 p.m. on Wednesday evening and stated that Mrs. Hundley had locked the rear door behind him. Officers who arrived at the house four hours later found this door unlocked. Another neighbor, Olga Casper, who lived next door to the Hundleys, testified at the inquest that she had heard the fatal shots fired and had seen the lights in the house turned off immediately after. She said she heard someone running past her home, coming from the direction of the Hunley house and toward Victor's house a short time later. The person was so close to the house, she said, that they stumbled against a radio ground wire. Investigators from the Jackson County Sheriff's Office searched the route described by Mrs. Casper and followed it to Victor Hunley's home, which was just 200 yards away. Along the path, officers found several slips of paper that were presumed to have been lost in flight. One paper, dated December 5, was a notice of the termination of partnership of Mr. and Mrs. J.C. Hundley with Victor Hundley in his coal business. Another paper was a bank deposit slip, the back of which bore notes that figured out the interest on a loan that amounted to $532. The note was in Luella's handwriting, and at the top of the paper was written, Vic. Victor Hundley was brought in for questioning and subjected to seven hours of interrogation by Sheriff William Flanagan and his investigators. His house was also searched, and a blood-stained khaki shirt was discovered. Hundley claimed that he'd been wearing the shirt when he was told about the crime. Police officers awakened him and told him that his father and stepmother had been murdered, and asked him to come to the house. While he was wearing the shirt, Hundley said, he had picked up the body of his stepmother. According to investigators, Hundley had never touched the body, so the blood had to have come from somewhere else. Suddenly, Victor recalled that he'd been wearing the shirt while quail hunting, and that was where the blood had come from. Victor denied that there was any trouble between him and his father. 
They had gone through some troubles in the past, he admitted, but that was all over. He told investigators that on Wednesday night he had been home all evening reading and playing with his son. He had gone to bed early and was awakened by the police. Hundley also admitted that he owned a 45 caliber revolver, but he claimed that he had recently loaned it to his father. The search of both of the Hundley houses failed to turn up the gun. To this day, it has never been discovered. After hours of exhaustive questioning, Victor broke into tears and cried out, Oh my God, this is terrible! He again swore that he had nothing to do with the murders. He was taken home but was placed under house arrest as the investigation continued. On December 15, immediately following the funeral of the Hundleys, Victor was arrested for their murders. While the coroner's jury was unable to name the killer, Fletcher Lewis, the state's attorney, believed that he could prove that Victor was guilty in a court of law. Unfortunately, it wouldn't work out that way, and on December 31, Lewis was forced to let Victor go. He filed a motion during Hundley's preliminary to dismiss the case due to insufficient evidence. The judge sustained the disappointed prosecutor's motion. Lewis made a statement to reporters after the hearing. While the facts and circumstances learned from the investigation amply justified the holding of Victor Hundley and the filing of a complaint charging him with murder, I have decided to prosecute this particular case no further, he said. Then he added, I feel quite sure that the atrociousness of this crime will compel the conscience of the person who committed it to someday make public his guilt. But Lewis was wrong. No one ever came forward, and the killers of J.C. and Luella Hundley were never found. The case languished in limbo for a time and then was relegated to the unsolved section of the city's law enforcement files. There were many who believed that Victor Hundley had gotten away with murder, but they could never prove it. Victor never spoke of the crimes again, and he continued to live on in the Carbondale area for the rest of his life. Eight decades later, the murders of Carbondale's former mayor and his wife remain unsolved. And perhaps, for this very reason, many have come to believe that their spirits do not rest in peace. The Huntley Mansion at the corner of Maple and Main Streets remained empty for two years after the murders. The only physical reminder of the horrific crimes that occurred there was a bullet hole in the wall near where Luella's body had been found, but the memories of that night remained in the minds of people in town. The house remained vacant until 1930 when it was purchased by Edwin William Vogler Sr. He bought the house and all of its contents from the Hundley estate. It remained in the Vogler family until 1972 when it was sold to a family named Simmons, who converted the huge residence into a gift shop with apartments upstairs. In 2000, it was sold to Victoria Spria, who ran the gift shop for five years before selling it to make more time for her young son. It was later turned into a bed and breakfast for a time. Rumors that date back many years claim that the Hunleys still haunt this house. A number of the past owners and tenants in the building have had strange encounters that they are unable to explain. One former resident told of loud knocking sounds that reverberated in her room at night and the faint sound of the downstairs piano as the keys tinkled by themselves. Her family also recalled hearing footsteps going up and down the stairs, as if perhaps the killer of the Hunleys was doomed to repeat his walk to J.C. Hunley's bedroom again and again. Former owner Victoria Spria said that whenever she was alone in the house, lights would turn on by themselves, as if someone were watching over her. She said that she believed that Luella's ghost followed her home from work on at least one occasion. Walking into the empty house, she heard pots and pans clanging and noticed that lights were on in the kitchen. However, she noted, it's not like a scary presence, it's a very peaceful vibe. Perhaps it's not a scary presence, but it could be unnerving. Spria was sometimes bothered by a door that opened by itself and by footsteps that she heard walking on the stairs. 
the same stairs where a previous family also reported disembodied steps. Tenants who lived in apartments on the upper floor also told stories of the creaking stairs and what definitely seemed to be the sound of boots or heavy shoes clomping on the wooden risers. One tenant laughed and stated that this was only the sound of the old house settling and then lost his grin when he admitted that he had never heard of a house that settled in just that way. Victoria Spria's daughter, Nina Bucciarelli, also recounted odd incidents in the house, like the front porch swing that would move by itself even when there was no wind. Spria's husband also had noticed this odd occurrence. Nina had her own explanation for the swing's strange movement. As night, if you drive by the porch swing, it's just swinging away. I think Mr. and Mrs. Hundley still like to swing at night, she said. And perhaps she's right because if the stories of the past decades are to be believed, the Hunleys have not yet departed from the house they called their own and the place where their lives were taken away too soon. This episode is dedicated to the men and women of our armed forces and first responders. Whether you are currently serving or have served in the past, you are appreciated. It is because of your courage and sacrifice that we enjoy the freedoms and liberties we hold dear. And I, for one, appreciate every single one of you for protecting what many of us take for granted. So thank you. As has been proven time and time again throughout the years, words like unsinkable and fireproof seem to mean very little when it comes to the power of the forces of nature. Ships sink and theaters and hotels burn, but few of them burn with the kind of horror seen at the Weinkauf Hotel on December 7, 1946. The hotel, with 285 guests, crowded into 194 rooms, was gutted by a six-hour fire that claimed the lives of 119 guests and injured another 90, making it the worst hotel fire in American history. There were 285 guests that checked into the hotel that night, and it's possible that even after death, many of them have never checked out. The Weinkauf Hotel in Atlanta, Georgia, was built at Peachtree and Ellis Streets by W. Frank Weinkauf in 1913. After he retired, Weinkauf continued to reside at the hotel that he loved. He was convinced that it was a safe place, as were city officials, who deemed the hotel fireproof, a term that has since been discontinued by the National Board of Fire Underwriters. Like most hotels in Atlanta in those days, it had no sprinkler systems and no outside fire escapes. It had been built with a central staircase winding around an enclosed bank of elevators, and aside from the elevators, the staircase was the only method of escape from the building. In spite of this, the hotel was pronounced safe when it was inspected only a short time before the disastrous blaze by the city's fire marshal. The building was supposedly of fireproof construction, which merely meant that the framework of the building would remain sound after a fire. It said nothing of the contents, and unfortunately, people are not fireproof. The hotel was 15 stories tall, with the floors numbered consecutively except for number 13, which was eliminated from the numbered system for the usual superstitious reason. The structure was protected by a shielded steel frame, and the roof and floors were made from concrete. The exterior was composed of 12-inch thick brick panels, and inside partitions were constructed of tile plastered on both sides, ensuring that the structure would remain stable. Unfortunately, 
The walls and hallways were covered with painted burlap from the wooden baseboards to the chair rails, above which they were papered. Corridor floors had wall-to-wall -wall carpeting over felt padding. Doors to rooms were of light panel wood with wood frames and transoms. The rooms were wallpapered, some with as many as five layers of paper, and ceilings were painted. A few of the guest room windows were fitted with wooden Venetian blinds, but most were fitted with ordinary cloth drapes. While the building itself was indestructible, apparently little thought was given to its contents, which were, of course, highly flammable. A kitchen stove, for example, is a fireproof device that contains flame for controlled use and function, but it can still burn flesh if anyone were unwise enough to try and climb inside. The hotel's design also included many openings, mostly vertical, such as ventilating shafts. These openings also had a hidden use. In the event of a fire, they would serve as chimneys and fans to draw oxygen-seeking flames onto all 15 floors. The hotel was also equipped with transoms above the guest room doors, which, when opened, would also help to spread flames in the case of a fire. The two elevator shafts, as mentioned, were centrally located with a single staircase wrapping around it up and down the length of the building. The stairs began on each floor as a single staircase and then branched off into opposite directions, halfway up, each stairway leading to two long corridors that ran parallel to each other. Since the elevator shafts were enclosed with fire-resistive materials, a blaze, should it occur, would probably proceed up the staircase, feeding on the burlap wall covering, wallpaper, and woodwork. On the morning of December 7, 1946, the Weinkauf Hotel was filled nearly to capacity with almost 300 guests on the hotel register. It was 3.30 a.m. when the hotel's night clerk, Comer Rowan, who was sitting in for his wife, noticed the switchboard light for room 510 was blinking. The guest asked for some ginger ale and ice. Rowan rang up for Billy Mobley, the only night bellhop on duty. Mobley took the items up in the elevator and was joined on the trip by the night engineer, who was making his routine nightly check. When they arrived at room 510, they had to wait for three minutes because the guest was in the bathtub. Meanwhile, the elevator operator, a young woman, slowly took the car back downstairs. Around the third floor, she thought she smelled smoke and took the elevator down to the basement. From there, she ran up to the main floor and told Rowan. He told her to go to the fifth floor and find Mobley and the engineer. Leaping over the desk, Rowan raced up the stairs to the mezzanine and saw flames reflected there in a mirror. He dashed for the telephone and called the fire department. It was 3.42 a.m., and within a few minutes, three ladder and four pumper companies pulled away from their station two blocks away. On the fifth floor, Mobley and the engineer emerged from room 510, where they had spent a few minutes talking to the night owl guest. As they opened the door, Flames and dense clouds of black smoke swept toward them. They slammed the door closed. Rowan plugged in every guest telephone as fast as he could, shouting, Fire! 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 Then the switchboard went dead. The guests that had been sleeping peacefully in their rooms were now on their own. There was no fire alarm in the fireproof hotel. By the time the firemen arrived, the building was in chaos filled with rushing, frenzied people, many of them ready to jump from the windows high above the street. The firemen urged them not to jump, even though the hotel from the third to the fifteenth floor was a blazing inferno. The firemen were faced with the dilemma of fighting the fire or saving the frantic guests who were shrieking from the window ledges above them. They chose rescue, hurried to their ladders and sent them up. More fire brigades began to arrive until the city's complete 60-piece fire department was surrounding the burning hotel. Their ladders, though they reached to the 10th floor, could not be elevated quickly enough. Everything inside of the hotel was burning. Drapes, wooden trim, furniture, bedding, and with no sprinkler system to douse the blaze, 
the hungry flames swept through the hallways and blasted up staircases and elevator shafts. Most of the transoms above the guest room doors were open, as were the windows, which created even more drafts to feed the flames. Bedsheets were hung from the windows to be used as ropes, but were far from the ground. With no way to escape, the heat of the flames drove the guests to the windows. One woman appeared on a seventh-floor ledge holding her two children. A ladder shot up to meet her, but before it came within reach, she threw her small son into the air, followed by her daughter, then fell into the darkness, hurling toward the street below. A newspaper reporter on the scene wrote about what happened next. Her nightgown shone white against the flames behind her as she stood on the window ledge, high above the street. Then it, too, caught fire. She jumped, but she missed the net stretched by the fireman. She landed astride overhead wires. There she hung in flames. Finally, her body broke loose and toppled to the ground. A fireman reached one woman on the fifth floor just as she was losing her grip on the window ledge. He swung her around the ladder and onto his back. As he backed downward with her, another woman jumped from a ledge several floors above. She struck the fireman and the woman on his back, and all three of them fell to their deaths. Even though firemen and spectators on the street urged those on ledges not to move, scores of bedsheets tied together to form ropes began to be tossed from windows and half-crazed guests began to lower themselves toward the street. One girl crawled two floors downward on one of the makeshift ropes. A fire ladder swung over to get her, and holding the sheets with one hand, she lunged for the ladder. But a split second before she could grab it, the sheets came apart, and she crashed to the pavement. The firefighters and the spectators held out safety nets, hoping to catch anyone who fell or jumped from the windows. One man missed a net by inches after jumping from the tenth floor. On the eighth floor, a woman stood on a window ledge, begging for someone to save her four-year-old son. As flames roared from the window behind her, she flung the little boy into the air. One of the spectators saw that there were no firemen near the place where the boy would land, and he raced to the spot. Miraculously, he caught the boy in the air, and the child was saved without injury. The mother fell a few seconds later, but was killed by the fall. After seeing others leap to their death, a suicidal frenzy spread among the endangered hotel guests. Perhaps they believed that a certain death on the concrete below was better than burning to death or worse, surviving with permanent injuries. Others began to jump, sometimes regretting the decision after it was too late. A girl scrambled for a ladder two floors below as searchlights swept over her, highlighting a face that was filled with terror. She groped for the ladder, blinded by the light, and missed. Her body fell crazily, spinning out of control, and smashed through the hotel's marquee. Another woman climbed out onto the makeshift bedsheet ropes and began to lower herself. It appeared that she might make it to one of the firemen's ladders, but then another woman crawled out of a window and flung herself onto the same bedsheet rope. Their combined weight caused the sheets to tear apart, and both of them fell to their deaths. Many of the guests were saved by the nets that were spread out by the firemen below. However, a few of them hit the nets with such force that the handles were ripped from the would-be rescuers' hands, and hurtling bodies struck the earth. There was nothing that could be done for those who hit the pavement under those circumstances. A girl on the seventh floor had been patiently waiting for rescue as the flames began creeping out of the window behind her. A net was finally arranged below. Spectators heard her shout, I hope I live, I hope I live, and then she jumped. She lived, although she broke a hip, one arm, and one leg. The suicidal mania that had gripped the guests stopped after twenty or so of them fatally plunged to their deaths. More and more of them crept out onto the window ledges to escape the deadly heat, flames, and gas, and waited their turn for rescue. Heroic firemen worked swiftly to get them down from the building safely. 
A number of the rescuers were injured during the effort, and 25 of them were later hospitalized for smoke inhalation. While many of the firemen had set to work trying to rescue the hotel guests who were clinging to the window ledges on the sides of the building, others had rushed inside to try and get control of the blaze. Inside of the lobby, a section of firemen began battling their way up the main staircase from the second floor, their hoses blasting the flames with water. They could hear the screams of trapped guests burning to death in the rooms above them. One man tried to seal off his room, taking his family into the bathroom. He turned on all of the water faucets, but the heat from the flames almost instantly turned the water into steam. The toilet exploded, as did many others, and the man was found later asphyxiated with his head in the shower. His wife, holding onto their children, lay next to him. All were dead. One couple that was trapped on the 14th floor was determined to live. As flames shot through the transom over the door and ignited the room, they crawled out onto the window ledge and slipped into the room next door where the transom was closed. The couple there was trying to barricade the door. The man and woman on the ledge climbed into the room and tried to help. Both couples jammed a mattress against the door, constantly soaking it with water from the bathroom. For two hours, they soaked the mattress as the room filled with steam. But they lived. A military officer, Major Jake Cahill, was in another room with his wife. He had sealed the transom and then had waited anxiously until a ladder reached the seventh-floor window ledge of their room. Cahill's elderly mother was in the room next door, but he was unable to reach her because of the fire. After he climbed down the ladder to safety behind his wife, Cahill immediately rushed into the mortgage guarantee building next door and ran up the stairs to the seventh floor. He went from window to window until he saw his mother's room directly across an alley. He obtained a long plank from somewhere, extended it between the two buildings, and then crawled across it. He then led his mother back across the shaking board to safety. Cahill alerted other guests about the plank, and one of those saved by this method was Major General Paul W. Bade, who had commanded the 35th Army Division in Europe during World War II. He managed to bring his wife with him into the building across the alley. For six hours, the firemen fought their way, floor by floor, through the fire, extinguishing blazes on each floor before continuing upward. None of them had ever experienced a fire with such intensity, and as they broke into one room after another, they discovered scenes that were beyond their comprehension. Brass doorknobs and telephones had melted, light bulbs were fused, heavy metal elevator doors were twisted, in some rooms only the bed springs remained, the rest of the furnishings having been completely consumed by fire. The dead were everywhere. Bodies sprawled in hallways, smothered by the smoke and lack of air. A dead woman was found at an open window. She was untouched by the fire, seemingly asleep, with only a trickle of blood at the corner of her mouth. Room after room contained corpses of those who had died in bed, never realizing the hotel was ablaze around them. Yet, in the midst of all of this, the hotel stood, its structure still sound and fireproof. When the pale winter sun rose that day in Atlanta, crowds assembled to see the firemen carry away the corpses of 119 people. Another 90 people were taken away on stretchers to area hospitals. The worst hotel fire in American history was finally over. Among the dead was W. Frank Weinkoff, suffocated in his 10th floor suite. Although he had sold his beloved hotel in 1937, he continued to live there in his retirement, insisting until the day that he died that Atlanta's finest hotel was completely fireproof. The building that was once the Weinkoff Hotel survived the fire. Although nearly gutted, it reopened in the 1950s as the Peachtree Hotel and then saw another incarnation in the 1960s as a retirement home. After changing hands several times, it sat vacant for years, dwarfed by the modern hotels and office buildings around it. 
more renovations were done in the 1990s, and it is now open once again as the Ellis Hotel, a place that has its share of ghostly tales. Stories have circulated for years that lingering remnants of the fire remain behind at the new hotel. Some of these stories even date back a few years to when the Ellis was being renovated. At the time, workmen on the job claimed that they were hearing footsteps and voices in empty rooms and that their tools often disappeared from where they had left them, mysteriously turning up at odd places. Most recently, guests and staff members have also reported footsteps, along with loud cries and noises in the corridors, as if a group of people were frantically running down the hall. When they look out from their rooms or turn a corner in pursuit of the noisy guests, they find that no one is there. The hallway is empty and deserted. Some also claim that they've been awakened at night to the smell of smoke, only to find that nothing is burning. Perhaps most disconcerting, though, are the faces, eerie apparitions of people's faces that have been reported peering out from the hotel's windows. The tales regarding these ghostly visages began many years ago when the building was abandoned. The faces were first believed to be those of homeless people or squatters sleeping in the place after it had closed down. Security officers who searched the building, however, found no one inside. As the years passed, the faces remained and are still sometimes reported today. These chilling images are distorted and unreal, human but inhuman, and some claim that they appear to be screaming in terror. Are they real or the result of fevered imaginations? Some believe the faces are nothing more than simulacra, the result of people's ability to perceive familiar images in random patterns, such as the play of light and shadow upon a window. There are others, though, who believe the images are real and that they are the horror-filled faces of the people who died screaming at the Weinkauf Hotel in 1946. Those who spend the night at the Ellis these days can judge for themselves. I was at Arlington Court in Devon, United Kingdom. Arlington Court is a beautiful old house and estate which belongs to the National Trust with very large grounds covering many hundreds of acres of gardens and woods with several lakes and a carriage museum. It really is an exciting trip. I was out on a walk with my wife and three young children last summer. This is at the Old Lake, which is on the mile walk away from the house. I was looking at the children when I momentarily glanced away towards the lake. I then, in a split second, saw a young woman with blonde hair wearing a long, pale blue dress looking out over the lake. Then she was gone. I looked back towards my wife, who had a strange, surprised expression on her face. I said, wow, did you see that? To which she replied, yes. We didn't say any more at that time, as the children were present, but later we compared notes. She described the dress as duck egg blue, and she saw more, a red picnic blanket and a coach with the woman moving off between the trees. She said she had an overwhelming feeling of peace and happiness and was not at all scared or threatened. I thought the dress looked Victorian, but was more simple than what I would have expected. This story took place in London, Ontario about 20 years ago. I was staying with my parents at a close family friend's house. Our vacation was going well until one night I was woken up by something tapping on my shoulder. Fast taps in rhythm. I tend to be a deep sleeper, but these taps woke me straight up. I turned over and switched on the light. Nothing was there. I turned the light off 
and lay on my back. About a minute later, the taps started again, but faster than before. I turned the light on again and could see nothing. I was getting scared by this point and didn't want to turn the light off. Eventually, I settled down and turned it off and the tapping started again. I was hysterical at this point, but turned the light on and kept my hand on the cable that switched it on and off. As soon as I switched it off, the light tapping started again. In the end, I slept with the light on for the rest of our stay. The following year, we stayed there again. I'd almost forgotten about my experience and was settling down to sleep one night when I heard giggling from the wardrobe. I got out of bed, went over to the wardrobe, and opened the door. Nothing was there. I went back to bed, switched the light off, and the tapping started again, followed by the giggling. This went on throughout the first night of our stay. I was getting very little sleep and felt awful. The second night, I kept the light on and went to sleep, but woke up later that night to the tapping. The light had been switched off. I flipped the switch and the light wouldn't switch on. I called for my parents who came, turned the light on, and told me to stop making a fuss. I was having a bad dream. The third night, I walked into the room in which I was sleeping and saw the shape of a person under the covers. I could make the shape of the body out lying under the covers. I stood with my mouth open as the shape deflated and left the bed empty. I slept with my parents that night. They couldn't understand why I was so afraid. The following day, I went into my room to pick up a pillow and saw a small girl sitting in a chair by the window. When I tried to say something, she turned and faded away. I started to wonder who this girl was. She was obviously trying to contact me. After I saw her, I wasn't as scared as I had been. But things kept happening. I heard crying in the night, footsteps, giggles, and the tapping kept taking place sporadically. To this very day, I still wonder who that girl was and what she wanted to tell me. Has anyone else had an experience like this? My grandfather passed away when I was 12 and I had to move into his old room, the one where he had passed. A few months later, I had a friend sleep over and we thought it might be fun to play with a witch board. So we lit some candles and decided to see if we could contact my grandfather. Nothing happened at first and we weren't really taking it too seriously. We stopped touching the board and we blew out all of the candles, only to have them all relight by themselves. The glass continued to move around violently across the board on its own. My friend lost it and asked to go home, and he did. Later, I resumed playing with the board myself. My TV was off, but it kept turning on and off, and my cord-pulled light switch also kept turning on. Meanwhile, the little shot glass I had on the board was still going crazy, moving by itself on the board. It didn't spell anything, but was just randomly moving around. I tried to get up, and all the candles went out, and I was left in total darkness. My twin-sized bed and box spring was thrown about 10 feet away, blocking the door. All the while, my TV and lights were going on and off over and over again. I screamed, and I'm pretty sure that I fainted, because when I opened my eyes, my mom and stepdad were freaked out. Everything in my room was upside down or sideways. Pictures on the wall were also upside down. That wasn't my grandfather. My parents also witnessed the board moving by itself, and my stepdad took it outside and burned it. 
I lived there another seven years, and I always felt something dark around me, even 20 years later. When I'm alone, I can still feel it almost behind me. The political season is upon us, and those flying the red colors have their promises. The politicians wearing blue have different promises. But those of us in the cryptid party have only one promise – to stay hidden and mind our own business. Don't let the political pundits, the candidates, the PACs, or your closed-minded brainwashed family and friends tell you who to vote for. You're smarter than that. That's why I'm telling you who to vote for. This November, pull the lever for Bigfoot and Mothman. Our new president, Bigfoot, won't make the same mistakes as humans have. Because he's not human, Bigfoot loves our country and you. So much so that he knows you have a better idea of how to run your life than he does. So he's staying out of your life. With Vice President Mothman, their new administration will do what no administration has done in the past. Absolutely nothing. Show your support for the Cryptid Party by grabbing your Bigfoot Mothman 2024 merchandise with campaign buttons and stickers, hats, shirts, tote bags, mugs, hoodies, giant tapestries, pillows, magnets, even clothes for your kids to get them into the spirit of the political season. This year, vote for someone you can trust in, believe in, even without scientific proof of their existence. A vote for Bigfoot and Mothman is a vote you can be proud to tell others about. Get your Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 merchandise now at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Available in all sizes and colors, even red and blue if you want to confuse people about your party loyalties. The new Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 political campaign merchandise at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. They say you can get anything at Walmart. We've had numerous stories of black-eyed children lately here on Weird Darkness, but note that this story took place in the 1970s, long before the current wave of stories got started. I was around 12 when this incident took place. I didn't know anything about black-eyed kids until a few years ago when I started reading reports on the internet about these strange incidents. My story is a little different to those other accounts. I was sitting in my mom's car, waiting for my mom to return. She was inside Walmart, and I had elected to wait in the car with my book. The young boy had walked past the car a few times, and I hadn't really taken that much notice of him. The fourth or fifth time the boy went past, I think he noticed me as he came over to the car and stared in at me. I tried to ignore him and read my book, but he started whispering, Let me in. I knew the front doors were locked and checked the doors at the back. My side was unlocked, but the side the boy was on was locked. I locked my side. The boy kept pleading to be let in. The boy then went quiet and stared at me for a few minutes before walking away. I want to talk about the eyes. This boy had completely black eyes. There was no other color to be seen, just pure blackness. He didn't blink. He didn't wince or show emotion. His face was stony white. When he spoke, I seemed to hear the words in my head more than through my ears. When he tapped on the window, it was slow and methodical. He didn't seem to be in any danger or really need my help. He wasn't panicking. It was almost like he was a robot under the control of someone or something else. The weirdest thing about this encounter was that my mother returned to the car a few minutes later and complained that some woman had approached her and asked for the keys to her car. She said my mother had blocked her in and this woman wanted to move her car. My mom knew she hadn't. This strange woman became quite insistent, and my mother had been forced to ask a security guard to help her. 
To my knowledge, our incidents had taken place at exactly the same time. She also told me that the woman's eyes were strange. Not completely black, but almost. So were these two incidents related? I think so. But how did two seemingly unconnected people manage to communicate so effectively over such a distance? Keep in mind that this happened in the 1970s, before the micro-technology of today. Were they under the control of another person, or were they able to communicate telepathically? What is going on? This story took place 26 years ago. My dad told me about this incident and I think it's probably one of the scariest things I've ever heard. My father does not have much of a sense of humor, so I'm pretty sure he did not fabricate any part of it. When my mom was pregnant with me, we lived in a rural part of Virginia. My mom arrived home after giving birth to me, but her health began to worsen with time and it made my dad worried. He consulted a lot of doctors who deemed it was normal because my mom was anemic. They prescribed a lot of medications, but nothing seemed to work. One early morning, Dad got up to go to the bathroom. When he was coming back to the room, he heard someone or something sigh. He thought my mom was probably sleep-talking and didn't pay any attention to it. The sighing continued, and then he heard me crying. He rushed to the room only to be filled with absolute horror. What he saw was my mom lying in bed with her hands, legs, and head bending outwards with me crying uncontrollably. He froze on the spot, but soon recovered, picked me up, and ran out to call the neighbors for help. When the neighbors came, they saw my mom lying there she had passed out. My father tried to explain what had happened, and they told him about a family who had lived in our house some time before. Apparently a husband, his wife, and his mother lived there. The guy and his mother were abusive and they tortured the wife whenever they pleased. The wife soon became pregnant, but the family accused her of carrying someone else's child. She denied it and protested the accusations laid on her. This made her husband and her mother-in-law furious, and they killed her in a fit of rage. They dumped her body somewhere and ran away. It was the belief of our heavily Catholic neighbors that my mom was possessed by the spirit of the woman. Dad didn't believe this at first, but started to wonder when they gave him a book about possession. With things not getting any better, my father asked a priest to come and see the house. A couple of days later, the priest visited. As soon as he entered the house, my mom started acting weird, sneering and hissing at him. As soon as he saw that, he knew that something was going on. He blessed her and ordered the entity living inside my mom to get out. At first, it refused. But then the priest threw some holy water at her, causing her to scream in pain. He then ordered her to get out again and to tell him where she was buried. Reluctantly, she did and left my mom's body. My mom passed out again. After this incident, we left that house and never even went near it. My mom never even knew what happened to her and died several years later in a car accident. My dad decided to never talk regarding this incident. I would appreciate any insight you have regarding this incident. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description, as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. 
If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.